special in store just for you tonight. How many of you are ready to receive it tonight? I'm believing God for it. Amen. I believe in God for it tonight. Let's receive it. Father, we love you and we thank you so much for the opportunity that you have afforded us to come together and worship you right here in the middle of the week. God, we ask you to bless every life, every family, every home that is represented in this service tonight. Oh God, everyone who's made the effort to be here, Lord. I know it's a busy time of year. There's a lot going on. But God, we want to take these next few moments to glorify and praise you, Lord. Oh, may we focus on what you're saying. I don't want to miss any blessing, God. I don't want to miss a healing. I don't want to miss a word that you have for me tonight. Oh, Lord, let us lock in and receive everything that you have in store. And we'll be careful, oh God, to give you glory, praise, and honor. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen, amen. Find two or three people, shake their hands, tell them how glad you are to see them on Wednesday night. Let's worship. Thank you.
Glory to God. Glory to God. I'm so glad. I'm so glad he let me see that he's the only thing that I need. Amen. Oh, what a privilege it is to be a child of God. I'm so glad I'm in his favor. I said, I'm glad I'm in the favor of God. And I'll go ahead and tell you right now, you can get mad if you want to, but the favor of God isn't fair. I said, the favor of God isn't fair. He favors those whom he, will, he, he wills. And I'm so glad that I'm one of those. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 I just want to let everybody know, in December of the second of this past year, I was diagnosed with bone cancer, incurable. My PSA number, according to the Veterans Administration, was 3,000. In December, when I got to the cancer center, it was 7,000. Three weeks ago, they came and told me after I had been through two months of treatment that my PSA had come down to 21.8. This past Tuesday, I got another report, and it's down to 7.7. .7. And I give God all the praise and the glory. They said if I get my PSA down to three or four, which is a normal rating, that I can possibly come off of the IV infusion and just take the chemo pills and they talk like I'm going to be on this treatment for a couple of years, but that's better than being dead. And I give God all the glory and the praise because I gave it to him. When I found out I had it, I gave it to God. Praise God. Stay right there. Just stretch your hand this way. We're going to believe God for, to finish what he started. Come on. He never alphas what he does in Omega. Father, in the name of Jesus, what you've already done. God, what you've already done is a miracle. But Lord, we want to see it to the completion. We're going to see it to the final, God. We know that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we're able to ask or think. God, I thank you for what you've already done. But finish it now, Jesus. Build our faith. Increase our faith. Who double shout the higher? May the next step, test he has, God, may it be found clear of this. In the name of Jesus, we give you glory. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for his healing power. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. I'm so glad he let me see that he's the only one that I need. Amen. That battle's not mine. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to you. Hallelujah. Just give that thing, surrender that thing to God and watch what he'll do in your life. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. Praise God. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. I thank God that his presence is here. I thank God that his glory is here, that his, that his will is in this house tonight. He's going to touch us and speak to our lives. Amen. I just want to say thank you so much for joining us on this Wednesday night. I realize it's a very busy season. Things are picking up. But I appreciate every time that you come. You make the effort to be here. I appreciate you so very much. Can't say enough. All of you who are joining us online have a wonderful online community. Thank you for joining us as well. And we pray to be a blessing to you and your family tonight in this service. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Please remember all of our senior adults. Tomorrow is your day. Tomorrow is the Oasis Senior Adult Senior Ministry Day here at the church. We ask you to join us in the morning at 10 a.m. We're going to have a wonderful time. Brother Harry said it's going to be a good one. So we want to see all of you here over in the fellowship hall. We invite you to come join us. Hey, if you're retired, you need to be over here. You, you identify as a senior adult. You need to be here tomorrow at 10 o'clock, and we hope y'all have a wonderful time together. Also, I wanted to say uh, thank Brother Luther Locklear. You know, y'all know Brother Luther Locklear. He, Brother Fix It. He always says, Fix It when I'm preaching. His mother passed away, 
and uh, his family has just been devastated by this loss. But he wanted to say thank you to everyone who has reached out to him. He also specifically wanted me to report to the church that all is well. Uh, so tomorrow we're going to have his uh, her services tomorrow at Hope County uh, Church of God. The family has asked me to speak. And so be in prayer for us tomorrow and their family. The whole uh, Locklear family has a great big family here in our church. And this affects a lot of people. So we're going to be praying uh, for them tonight. And the days that are to come, grief is never easy to walk through. But thank God we have the comfort of the Holy Ghost in times like these. Uh, thank you so much for Sunday. Didn't we have a wonderful time Sunday in the Lord? Didn't God move so powerfully in both of our services? I tell you what, I got so many pictures of mega stuffed Oreos. Well, all week long, and I got, and I tell you what, I was blessed. Brother Keith Banks gave me a whole pack of mega stuffed o Oreos. He has heard the will of God, and I got it in my truck. He gave it to me just a second ago. Amen. But I'm glad I serve a mega God. Amen. Uh, that God that's exceedingly able, abundantly to do all that we're able to ask or think. Praise the Lord. This time our ushers are coming to receive our evening tithe and our offering. As always, we want to say thank you so much for your giving. For all that you do, all that you give, you're given to the kingdom of God. And I want you to bless the Lord tonight in your giving because I know that he is faithful. Brother Bobby Pittman, ask the blessing over this offering. Yes, God. Amen. Give us unto the Lord tonight. Let him bless you tonight. that you do for the kingdom of God. And we pray blessings over you and your house tonight. At this time, Sister Lila Banks is coming to sing for us. And she is always such a blessing. Appreciate them, their family, what they mean to us, what they mean to this fellowship. We want you to worship with her tonight as she comes. Let her bless you.
stand all across the sanctuary as we prepare our hearts and minds for the word. Aren't you glad that we are in his care, under his wings, under the shadow of the Almighty? Amen. This is where I want to dwell. This is where I want to live. This is where I want to stay in the presence and the arms of Jesus. Turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to the Gospel of John, chapter 2. The Gospel of John, chapter 2. And we'll start there in verse number 1. Familiar scripture I don't think I'll get too far through this message tonight, but I am going to give you all I have. I'm going to give you everything I got. I prepared. I said, Lord, I'm preparing the best I know how. I'm praying as much as I can, and I'm going to give you all I got tonight. And I pray you come ready to receive the Word of God. Amen. And I believe there's something, I believe something will be said that will help you, that will touch you, change you, challenge you, transform you, because that is the power of the Word of God. John chapter 2, verse number 1. If you have it, say amen. At the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, when they ran out of wine, 
The mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. I want to preach to you tonight for just a few moments, very simple thought on what the Lord has given me for you tonight, for you. A message entitled, When the Wine Runs Out. When the wine runs out. Please stretch your hand this way and ask God to help us. I feel like I need him tonight. Father, I love you so much. As always, God, we just stand here, Lord. We stand in awe of your presence and your anointing. God, we stand here as humbly as we know how because we realize how limited our abilities are. We realize our many deficiencies, God. God, we understand how frail this humanity is, but God, we understand how omnipotent Oh, and omniscient your glory is. And we ask you, God, to send your holy presence in this place. Oh, God, one more time I ask you to anoint me. I'm just a man. I know that. A flesh and bone. But, God, I'm your man upon whom the Spirit of God can rest. In these next few moments, God, let that anointing rest on me. May it cover me, God, from the top of my head, the sole of my feet. Lord, this is the message you have given me for your people tonight. God, let me preach with clarity, God. May we understand the words. Don't let a word fall on deaf ears. But God, may the seed of your word find root in the life of every heart that is here. Give us, God, give us your spirit to touch us. And we honor you now in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You be seeing the presence of God. As you know, the last several weeks, we have been following John's gospel. And in that, in that story of John, we have discovered what is the origin, the origin story of Christ's earthly ministry. In John's first chapter, the gospel writer covers several events that reveal the deity of Jesus. It's in this first chapter that John declares Jesus to be the Word made flesh. It's important that we know this. He declared him to be the Word made flesh who was in the beginning with God and was God himself. John goes on to tell of the miraculous baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River in the first chapter, which marked the beginning of his earthly ministry. Then, in the later portions of the first chapter, John identifies the beginning of Christ's followers as Jesus assembles his team of disciples. We now have Andrew, John, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel who are all accompanying Jesus in the beginning, in this first chapter in John. And the last time we saw Jesus in John chapter 1, the writer left us with a powerful image of Nathaniel crawling out from under the fig tree and making that great declaration and proclamation, declaring Jesus to Jesus, saying, Thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of of Israel and down Nathaniel along with these other first disciples have made the distinction that Jesus is the Messiah the one whom the prophets and the and Moses did write and foretell and as we close John chapter 1 it appears now that everything is set up for Jesus to actually begin his earthly ministry there's several beginnings that I just listed in John's first chapter uh, everything appears now to be in order. Everything appears to be set to begin his ministry. He's been baptized. The heavens have opened. God the Father has spoken from over him, from heaven. The Holy Ghost has descended upon Jesus as a dove. And now he has a team of disciples who are ready to facilitate him wherever he may go. It, it appears on the surface that everything is ready to go. Everything is in order. And don't don't you know, don't you know that the faith of these newly appointed disciples at this time is at an all-time high. They are ready to take on the world with Jesus. These men 
have forsaken everything. They've forsaken their houses, their jobs. They've forsaken everything to follow Jesus wherever he leads them. These men, don't you know these men are, are, are ready. They're chomping at the bit to see prophecies fulfilled and demons cast out and the sick healed and even the dead raised. Man, they are ready. This is the beginning. This is the start. Everything is ready. Everything has been prepared. Amen. So can you imagine their surprise in the beginning when Jesus informs these men that before we leave this town of Cana, I have to make a quick pit stop first. We're ready to go, Jesus. What are you talking about? We're ready. We're ready for this ministry to begin. The, uh, chapter one was the chapter of beginnings. We're ready to go. Let's go. Let's see this thing through. But Jesus has been invited to a wedding. Of all things, Jesus has been invited to a wedding. These disciples, of, of, of all the things in the world that these disciples were expecting in their first mission, I'm sure a wedding ceremony did not make the list. Somebody say amen. Amen. Apparently, someone in Jesus' family was getting married in the same town of Cana of Galilee. And Jesus received an invitation a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month, I don't know, to join the wedding festivities that began three days earlier. And the Bible tells us in verse 1 of John chapter 2, it was the third day of the marriage feast in in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there, Mary was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. If you know anything about God, let me just talk to us a moment right here. If you know anything about God, you'll know that God loves a good wedding. Amen. If you know anything at all about God, you'll know that God loves a good wedding. All throughout the scriptures, Brother David, from the very beginning to the very end, we see this thread of weddings being woven throughout history. In Genesis, God himself performed the first wedding between Adam and Eve. Throughout the Old Testament, we find when, in the book of Hosea, where the Lord tells the prophet to go marry a prostitute that God might reveal his everlasting covenant, what it looks like to his people Israel. In the Revelation, it's the bride of Christ who will feast at the marriage supper of the Lamb and be reunited with the groom. From the beginning to the end, weddings are an integral part of the story of God. I wanna preach just a moment right here. This might be why hell is attempting to destroy the very foundation of biblical marriage. This might be why Satan is working so diligently to redefine what marriage is in our social construct. This might be why the enemy is fighting so hard against our young families and against young marriages within the church because Satan knows the value that God places on marriage. And because God loved weddings so much, Jesus being God makes it a point to attend this wedding before he does anything else in ministry street, my God, before he heals anybody, before he casts out any devils, I'm about to preach, before he raises any dead folks, before anything else begins, he wants to ensure first that he attends this wedding to which he has been invited. Oh yeah, to see, you see, you see, weddings at this time in Eastern culture, they weren't just one day event. Nowadays, people get married, it takes two or four hours depending on how much money the daddy has and how many people attend. Now, if we could only get our weddings and our marriages to last as long as the weddings, that's a different message for a different time. It's a different time. It was a different season. Things were much different now, but weddings in this Eastern culture were more like festivals than just a wedding ceremony. In fact, their wedding ceremonies uh, took place over the span of several days, uh, over a week sometimes. A wedding ceremony in the small town of Cana in Galilee would have been the greatest event for the whole year. And family and friends were invited from all across Israel to come 
come and celebrate the marriage of this young couple. Hosting a wedding of this magnitude was a huge undertaking. It was the great financial burden to the groom's family. I don't know how that got lost in translation. I only have one daughter, but now it's the responsibility of the bride's family to provide for everything. But in this time, it was the responsibility of the groom's family to host, to celebrate this marriage of this young couple. Hosting this wedding of this was a huge undertaking. You see, in Eastern culture, the groom's family was responsible for providing all the accommodations, the entertainment, the food and the drink for all of the invited guests for the duration of this week-long ceremony. Can you imagine the expense? Can you imagine the burden? Can you imagine the stress of hosting this wedding? And if hosting all of these guests all week long wasn't stressful enough, there's always the fear in the back of your mind of running out of supplies. You see, if for some reason a family could not adequately supply the wedding party, it would be considered a catastrophe. It would be the greatest embarrassment for this groom and his family. This would be considered shameful and disgraceful in many Eastern cultures, especially Israel during this day. And if that's not bad enough, running out of supply could also lead to a lawsuit with the bride's family. In some cases, an annulment would be granted if the groom and his family failed to meet the demands of the wedding party and the guests. So even though weddings were a happy occasion, a joyous time, each ceremony, remember, had the potential to go sideways very quickly. Each ceremony had the potential to end very poorly if the supply just so happened to run out. So it should be a time of celebration. It always had the potential to end in disaster. And this is exactly what is happening here in John's second chapter in Cana of Galilee. After only three days of wedding festivities, the supply has already run out and the wine was already gone. Tonight I want to observe what happens when the wine runs out because I believe there are some folks in here who are absolutely running out of wine. I believe there are some people in this service tonight who are running on empty. It's so interesting to me that John tells us about this particular wedding because none of the other synoptic gospels share any details about it all. Maybe Matthew, Mark, and Luke weren't invited. Maybe they didn't consider it to be something worthy of writing down. But from his writing, John gives us a vivid image of this wedding that is taking place, this ceremony that is happening here in Cana of Galilee. And from his writing, we can deduce a couple of things that John tells us in these first couple of verses in chapter 2. The first thing we can discover from this in his writing is by receiving a personal invitation, I've already mentioned this before, Jesus was likely related to the groom. This is also why we see Mary, the mother of Jesus, serving at the wedding and not being served herself. So we can assume that at least half of this crowd at this wedding party was at least somehow in some way familiar with Jesus. We can also deduce from these couple of verses that the wedding feast is only halfway over. When we read the story, the wedding is only three days in uh, into a several day event. And I can almost see Jesus and his disciples. They had just picked up Nathaniel. They had just got him out from under the fig tree. They're still in Cana. And they start walking into town. They can hear the music playing before they get there. They can see the streamers. They can see the town. In many cases was decorated. Everybody knows a wedding is going on. And as Jesus and his disciples now in tow, they make their way to the wedding party. They start seeing the crowd. And Jesus is smiling. I'm sure he is. He's greeting people. He's hugging relatives. He's kissing ants on the cheek. I'm sure. He's, 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 he's shaking hands with old friends. Have 
having a wonderful time. He's just smiling, catching up. He's having a good time meeting everybody. Say, how you doing, Jesus? I'm doing good. Been a while. Man, you're a lot grown. You're grown. You're grown. Man, look at that beard you got on your face. I had not seen you since you were just a boy. Yeah, it's good to see you too. Man, he's just having the time of his life. While he, Jesus is over there having a good time, a wonderful time, Mary is a, somewhere in the back having a very bad time. Jesus is smiling, laughing, cutting up. Mary is worried to death because when the wedding party ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus ran to him when she heard he was there. She ran to Jesus and she said unto him, Jesus, they have no wine. This was some greeting, wasn't it? They have no wine. She didn't ask, son, where have you been? Son, you look like you need to eat. She didn't say, son, I've missed you, son. Uh, Jesus, I've been looking for you. No, how have you been? She didn't ask none of that. No pleasantries, no small talk at all. She cuts through all the fat and she says, Jesus, they have no wine. Mary greeted Jesus with a problem. And Jesus, this is supposed to be, for him, it's supposed to be a celebration. This was supposed to be a joyous time. But suddenly, it looks more like a disaster in the making. Oh, things are unraveling quickly on this third day of the wedding feast. I'm sure the disciples of Jesus thought they were walking up to a party, a good time. May, come on, maybe some of those hot dog weenies that, that you make in barbecue sauce and jelly. You know, maybe we're gonna get some of those. Maybe we're gonna get some hors d'oeuvres. Maybe we're gonna get something to drink. I don't know. Maybe we're here for a good time. Maybe we can do the cha-cha slide. Maybe we can dance a little bit if the DJ plays the right song. I don't know. But now, all of a sudden, now they're given this piece of information from the mother of Jesus and it appears they thought they were having a good time, but it appears everything's unraveling and everything's about to fall apart and what was a good time quickly turned into a bad time. And the obvious question is, the obvious, the obvious question is, how do you run out of wine? How do you run out of wine? You knew he was getting married. These ceremonies took months these ceremonies happened over the span, a great span of time. You knew as a father what was at stake. You knew your son's very future was hanging in the balance. And if you knew, you knew that this wedding could be legally annulled if something fell apart or if something went awry. You knew the dowry that was paid for your daughter could be kept. You could lose everything and still come out of this without a daughter-in-law. And so if you knew all of this, tell me how do you still run out of wine? If you know the ramifications, oh God, I feel you now. If you know what is at stake, how do you still run out of wine? I assure you, church, running out of wine was not intentional. I promise you, he didn't mean to. No one, no one would ever willingly put their family or their son through something like this. Oh, I feel like preaching. An honest mistake, Brother Caleb, and it was an honest mistake that was made somewhere in the planning or somewhere in the execution. An honest mistake was made. Someone somewhere dropped the ball. Something happened that caused what should be a wonderful event to become this stressful event on this day. I don't know exactly how it happened. I wasn't there. Then the Bible doesn't tell us. John doesn't give us any insight. But maybe, maybe, this is just me assuming, maybe this host family, maybe, maybe this host family that Jesus was related to, maybe they thought they had sufficient supply that would last throughout the duration of the party. Maybe. Maybe, I don't know, but maybe, maybe they were having supply chain issues and they could only purchase so much and they just hoped that they would have enough. Maybe someone miscalculated the number of guests or the number of days the festival would last. Maybe someone lost some barrels of wine somewhere along the way. I don't know. 
I don't know what happened. I don't know when it happened. I don't know where it happened. I don't know how it happened. But we do know that after only three days, the party had no wine. This family has discovered that sometimes even the best laid plans of man don't always work out like we want them to. Church, it is important for us to remember that sometimes you can do everything in your power to plan, to prepare, to practice, and even sometimes on your best days with giving your best effort, you can still come up short and you can still run out of wine. Oh, has anybody ever experienced that before? Or am I the only one? When you've done all you know to do, when you've prepared the best way you know how, I'm gonna preach to myself tonight, and you've done the best you can, you've done, you've prepared as good as you can in your own mind and strength, but, but now you realize that even though with my best effort, on my best day, with my best try, with my best foot forward, there are still some times that I can run out halfway through a season when I really need it the most. Now there is never a good time to run out of wine. There is never a good time in these Bible days to run out of wine. I'm going to tell you why. Because wine was necessary in these days. I want to teach right here just a minute. I want to help somebody right here. Uh, this, you, can, you can tell all your alcohol, all alcoholic friends what I'm about to tell you. Ready? You ready? Through the fermentation process... The juice turns to wine. And, these, and this wine now, as, 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 as it, because it's fermented, this wine now has natural antibacterial properties that sanitizes the water. Many times the water that they were drinking was unfit. The water was dirty. The water was filled with diseases. The water was filled with parasites and it would make you sick. So in biblical times, they would take the wine and mix some of the wine, just a little bit of the wine in with the water to cut the taste, first of all, but it would also kill the bacteria and make the water safe to drink. This is the difference in the scriptures between wine and strong drink. This when the Bible talks about strong drink. It means the straight wine. They didn't drink that. They drunk the wine that was diluted water used to sanitize or give an antibacterial property to the water. So there's never a good time. You can use that for all your alcoholics now. How your wine people, you can tell them that now. So there's never a good time to run out of wine. But if ever there was a bad time to run out of wine, it is here and it is now. Halfway through a wedding feast, my God with more days to go than are behind you well, when we read when we read in the Bible about the wine we know that the wine symbolically represents many spiritual attributes we know the wine is more than just a drink because we are spiritual beings Isaiah compared the wine to the joy of the Lord in the 55th chapter Joel compared the wine to the abundance of God oh Jesus spoke of wine as healing properties in Luke chapter 10 and we all know that the wine symbolically represents the blood. Oh it was in the last supper when Jesus said to his disciples in Luke 22 and 20 he said this cup this cup of this wine is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you my God. The apostle Paul compared this new wine to the Holy Ghost in Ephesians 5 and 18 he says and be not drunk with wine where it is excess but be filled with the spirit my God we know the wine is more than a drink it has spiritual symbolical representation so we understand the significance of the spiritual wine at work in our lives as believers we know how desperately how desperately we need this spiritual wine. We need this in our lives. Just like this family at this wedding, as believers, we are all keenly aware of the importance of having a sufficient supply of spiritual wine. We know we need it. We know we need the Holy Ghost. 
We know we need the blood. We know we need healing. Come on. We know we need abundance. We know we know we need joy. We understand all that. But let me tell you something. I will be the first to admit that there are moments in my life when I really, really need to draw from that reservoir of spiritual wine only to discover that the wine has run dry. Unfortunately, church, there are times when I feel like I really, really need a drink of spiritual wine, yet something has happened somewhere at some point for some reason that has drained my supply. There have been times when I could really have used a nice sip of joy. Has anybody ever been there? Those days when you really need the joy of the Lord to spring up from your soul. Those days when you're fighting discouragement. You know what I'm talking about? Am I the only one? That's fine. Uh, those days when you're fighting depression. When you don't, come on, those days when you don't want to come out of your house. Uh, come on, there are days when I reached for the pitcher of wine, of joy to drink from. And I found only to find that whenever I drink, and whenever I dipped into the reservoir, there was no wine left. There have been times that I wanted to drink from the healing wine when my body was wrecked with pain. I had gone through this long, prolonged process, this season of illness for far too long. And now this sickness is now messing with my mind. It would be bad enough if it just messed with my body, but now it's messing with my mind and my faith. But when I reached down and I really needed to feel better, when I reached down, to fill my cup of healing. Unfortunately, I discovered that I had run out of wine, that I had no healing. I could not heal myself. I'm preaching to me right now. It seems like there are moments when I needed the wine the most, that I had the least resources. It seems there's been occasions when the resources had run out. Has anybody ever been there? Come on. Those times when I had more month than money. I'm preaching now. The times I had a great need in my life the moments the moments of desperation that lead to stress so I need to draw from wine from the pots of abundance only to find that I had no wine there's never a good time to run out of wine but it always seems like I run low at the worst times Seems like I'm always running low when I need it the most. Seems like, Brother Mike, I always have the least whenever I need it the most. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It made sense whenever I was writing it out. It made sense when I was typing this out today. It made sense to me. Amen. If you don't get nothing out of it, I'm sorry. I'm preaching to me. There's times it seems like when I need it the most, when I need joy the most, it seems like I'm empty of joy. When I, when, when I come on, when I need blessings the most, it seems like I'm empty of blessings. When I need healing the most, it seems like the heavens are as brass above me and, I, and, I, and there's no healing to be found. It seems like when I need peace the most, all I can find is fear. It seems like when I need joy the most all I can find is heartache it feels like when I need answers the most all I can find is more questions and I go to draw from my from my reservoir of wine only to find I'm scraping the bottom and my resources and my supply has run dry I'm going to be very transparent with you. I feel like I have been experiencing this more lately than I ever have before. I feel like lately I've just been trying my best to draw from the bottom of the barrel only to come up empty time after time after time. Seems like whenever I pull my cup up from that reservoir that has filled me so many times now, there's only a drop left. The supply that I used to relish in and could almost bathe in now, I can't get a sip from. I know you've never been there before. I'm just going to preach to me. I felt that recently my supply has been depleting. 
And what's strange about it, says Dorothy, is that it's happening for reasons that I can't explain. I don't know if I could have done anything differently in this season. I'm not sure I could have prepared any better for this tumultuous time, Brother Harry. I thought I had sufficient supply. I thought I had plenty to last me through any season of my life. No matter the duration, oh, I'm preaching. No matter the longevity, I assumed I had, it appeared that I had enough, that I had plenty. But you listen to me clearly. But when the enemy begins his campaign against you, when the devil starts fighting you, when hell starts sending a barrage against you and starts attacking you on every side, let me tell you what happens. Not only to you, but what happens to your supply. It will drain you of your spiritual resources much faster than normal. When you go through spiritual warfare, when you go through spiritual hardships, when you're having spiritual dilemmas, when you are fighting, you're, come on, you're trying to fight these battles in the flesh. I'm preaching now. It'll wear you out physically. It'll wear you out emotionally. It'll wear you out spiritually. And you just keep dipping and dipping and dipping and drawing and drawing until you're empty. And there's no, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Until there's nothing left to draw draw from. Oh, oh, it's easy to draw from that well when life is good. Oh, it'll sustain you for months. But go through one hardship. Go through one trial and you'll see how quickly you use up all your wine. You can live off very little wine when nothing has happened to you and your family the last several months or years. That's why people can come to church when nothing's wrong. And they can just, I'm good, that's all I need. That's all I need. That's all I need. Get them a little sip, get them a little taste of the Holy Ghost. Just enough that I can wet my palate. Just enough so I can feel it, my God. Mm. I don't want, oh God. I don't want to be inebriated on the Spirit of God. I don't want to be drunk on the Spirit of God. I just want a little taste. That's all I need. That's all I need. That's all I need. That'll get me by until next week. That's fine. And that's fine. And that may work for you a while. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I've learned you can make it, Sister Early. I've learned you can make it on a limited supply when hell ain't coming against you. Come on. Well, you don't need much wine when Satan ain't bothering you. You don't need much, no. When the bills are paid, when the family is healthy, when life is good, when you haven't had to stay in the hospital overnight for a while, when you haven't had to go to the funeral home for a while. I'm good, that's all I need. That's all I need. I just wet my mouth every other Sunday. Oh, you got it so good. You don't even have to come to church on Wednesday. You got it so good. You can skip a couple of weeks and still be all right. But you hear me. You're gonna find yourself somewhere halfway through a wedding feast, halfway through a trial, halfway through a difficult season, and you're gonna reach for something. You're gonna reach for something, and there's gonna be no wine left. I see it happen so many times. And I have to fight the spirit of frustration because I see people take advantage of God and use Him like a spiritual Walmart. They only go when they need something. They don't, look, they don't worship Him in spirit, they just, in, in tr spirit and in truth. They just come to church because they need a little taste. And then life falls apart and the family and the family start they start separating. Now all of a sudden they want to get righteous and holy. Y'all ain't gotta say nothing. I know I'm preaching. Y'all ain't saying nothing because I'm preaching on y'all's family members. That's why y'all ain't gonna say nothing. When their children start living like the devil, all of a sudden we're going to get involved now. We're going to get involved. Hadn't been to church, hadn't brought them to church all of their life, but now they're 14, 15 years old. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden they're dating a thug now. Come on, all of a sudden she's dressing like a hoe now. All of a sudden you want to change everything and get all holy now. Let me tell you why. Because you can't live off a little sip. You can't live off just a taste. You've got to be committed to this thing. My God, who shut that behind? There's got to 
come a moment when you decide, I'm going to get enough. I'm going to make it through every trial. I need to fill, fill my cup, Lord. Fill me to overflowing. I don't want to die halfway through a trial. I don't want to die halfway through a ceremony. Oh, God. Ah. Uh. But now when you realize you run out, this is what's scary. This is what's scary. Because you're fine as long as you got yours. As long as everything's good, you're fine. But the moment you run out of wine, that's when panic sets in. Just ask Sister Mary. Just ask Sister Mary. Just read the words that she's saying. She's frustrated. She's panicking at this moment because she has run out of wine. Because now... Watch this. There's nothing she can do about it. There's nothing the family can do about it now. There's nothing left to draw from now. Mm. There's, no, there's no resources left. Allow me to preach right here, please. I want to slow down just a minute. I don't want you to miss this. Sometimes, listen, God will allow us to get halfway through a difficult season before we realize just how depleted we have become. I know you don't want to think this, but sometimes God and his sovereignty and omnipotence, sometimes God will let us run out of us in order to remind us that we cannot sustain us by our own resources. Brother Todd, I'm learning. I'm learning sometimes. God will wait until we see our own deficiencies before he shows up on the scene. Sometimes God will let us run dry and scrape the bottom of the barrel until, he, until it reveals our need for an outside source. Sometimes, sometimes God will let us run dry to remind us that we can't satisfy our longing of our soul with the affairs and the things of this world and the flesh. At this point, this groom's family currently has no options left Left. They're only halfway through this thing and now they're out of money. The cost of wedding, of the wedding has drained them completely. They're out of resources. Brother Caleb, even if they had the money, there's no way they could get the wine here on time. And they're also out of time because the process of making wine takes months and even years to ferment. And disaster is now looming over this family. So what are we going to do at this wedding I don't know. I don't know I wasn't there. But I just imagine the morning of that third day, they called a family meeting very quietly. Our side of the family. Come here. I need to speak with all the grooms family, please. They speak in hushed tones because they're afraid their emptiness might be discovered. They speak softly because they're ashamed of their own deficiencies. They don't want anyone to find out about their lack. I can almost hear the father of the groom whispering, saying, we're out of wine. It's the third day. We've got, we've got today and we've got to go through the whole weekend. It's Wednesday. How are we going to make it to Sunday? How are we going to make it? Oh, God. It's Wednesday. How am I going to make it to Sunday? Shh, don't tell anybody. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? I don't have any money. I spent everything I had. These people are piled up here. Just, this is where my money is. They've been eating my money. They're wearing my money. They drink my money up. I don't have any money. All of these people come expecting something and I don't have anything to offer. Our family's name and our reputation is on the line. Our son's marriage is at stake. Where did all the wine go? Where did it go? I thought we had plenty. What happened? What are we going to do? And in the midst of 
of the quiet panic, in the midst of the hushed chaos, I can almost hear Sister Mary begin to whisper. Can I speak? Can I say something? Sister Mary says, can I say something? She says, go ahead. Hey, I'm just asking. I'm just asking. Did you remember to invite Jesus? What? At a time like this, you want to, you worried about your son? Yes, I am. I just, did, 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 did you make sure, my God, that Jesus received an invitation? Did you, sh- I, 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 oh God, I, because I see you're running on empty. I just got to know, did you ensure that Jesus got an invitation? Did he RSVP or not? Okay, he did. I, listen, I just come to ask someone here tonight who is running low, who is running on empty, who is running out of wine, someone who can see the bottom of your barrel, someone who's tired, someone who's weary and well-doing, someone who knows they can't sustain this season much longer. I want to know, have you invited Jesus to the party? Have you invited Jesus to the party? Have you invited Jesus to your home? Have you invited Jesus to your marriage? Have you invited Jesus to come and be in your house? Did you remember to invite Jesus? I'll tell you something. Let me tell you why I asked that question, Brother Chris, because I've learned this. I've learned this. Because even if I mess everything else up, and even if I make a terrible mistake and miscalculation, and even when I plan poorly, and it's my own fault, and even when I can't blame anybody but myself, if I can make all the dumb decisions in the world, you listen to me, if you don't hear nothing else I say, you can make all the dumbest decisions in the world, but the smartest thing you can ever do is to invite Jesus himself into the party. Ask Jesus himself. My God, I feel like somebody's about to run out. I feel like somebody's about to run out. You barely made it through those doors tonight you've been running so low for so long you're making it on fumes but I've got great news for you you've invited Jesus into the house Jesus is in the house and if you'll invite him into your situation he'll turn that thing around I, I'll be honest with you I've I, I got to say this I've got to say, I'm moving on I promise you I'm trying to hurry I feel like Someone here in this house, you don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to say it's me. But I just feel like someone here is having a family crisis. I don't know what that means. I don't know if, I don't know if that's between you and your spouse or your children or your grandchildren. I don't know. I don't know. But I believe someone in this house is having a family crisis. You have come to the end of your supply. You have done all you know to do. And your pitchers are empty. Your pots are empty. Your barrels are empty. You've run out of answers. You've run out of options. You've run out of time. But I've got to tell you what Jesus told me today. But if you remembered to invite Jesus, but if you remembered somewhere along the line to invite Jesus, if you made sure God had an invitation, I promise you, I don't know what when, I don't know where, I don't know how, but I promise you, he will show up. He will show up. I know it's been three days. I know he let it get to the bottom, but if you invited Jesus, he'll show up somewhere at some point. Yeah, Mary, yes, yes. We sent him an invitation. We sent him weeks ago. He RSVP'd, but he ain't here. And the wedding started three days ago. It doesn't look like he's coming. If he was coming, he would have already been here. If he was coming, he would have already moved on my behalf. If he was coming, if he was coming, I wouldn't be having this problem right now. If he was here, my Lord, if he was here, I wouldn't have to be drawing from the scraping of the bottom of the bear. Oh, but I can hear Mary say, let me tell you something. Before you want to say something smart about my boy, let me tell you something. If you invited him, I guarantee you he'll come. If you invited him, I promise you if you invited him, I promise you he'll come. 
Well, Mary, I know he's a good boy, but what's he going to do when he gets here? What's he going to do when he gets here? She said, I don't know. I'm not sure. He's never done anything like this before. His ministry just began. His ministry just started. He's just in the beginning, my God. All he's ever done so far is taught in the synagogue at age 12, my God. I've never seen him do nothing like this before. He's never worked a miracle like this before. He's never worked in my house like this before. Listen, I don't know how he's going to work it out. I don't know when he's going to work it out, but I promise you, when he shows up, he sure enough can work it out, and he will work it out. He will. I said he will work it out. I want to build somebody's faith right here. God ain't finished yet. God is on the way. He might be on the way to the ceremony. He might be on the way to your crisis right now. Well, how are you so sure he can fix this? Mary, how are you so sure? What's he going to do? Does he have money I don't know about? Does he have resources I don't know about? He most certainly does. How do you know he's going to fix this? I'll tell you how I know. Because I was there when he was conceived. And the Holy Ghost overshadowed my virgin womb. Ooh, and the angel came to me and told me, he shall be called wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. How the angel said, you shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And he shall save the people from their sins. I was there when he was conceived. I I was there when he was born and the angels heralded his birth and the shepherds came glorifying God and the angels sung oh my God and the wise men were there I've seen my God I know he might not have moved like this before but I believe he can I know what you're up against now may be different than anything but I know he still can are you sure he can do anything about this? I'm positive he can. Well, how's he going to fix it? I don't know. What's it going to look like when he does it? I don't know. Where's the resources going to come from? I don't know. But that's why I have faith. Because I can believe him even when I don't see him. I can trust him even when I don't trust myself. I got to remind someone here tonight. I'm not sure how Jesus is going to work this out for you. I'm not real sure when he's going to work this out for you. You may be saying, preacher, I'm asking Jesus to do something I've never seen him do before. But I am positive that when Jesus shows up, I'm about to say this in faith, he will turn things around. I am confident, my brother, that when Jesus shows up, he'll turn cancer around. I'm confident he's never done it before. You've never had cancer before. I, I've never seen God do move like this before. I've never needed a miracle like this before. But I'm sure if he just shows up, I'm sure when he shows up, I'm sure when he comes on the scene, somehow or another, he's going to work this thing out. Mm. And when you have come to the end of yourself, You've scraped the bottom of your barrel. And you have nothing left to give. I am positive. I am positive that when he shows up, he will bring with him an abundant supply. Have you ever seen Jesus do what he's about to? No. But I believe he can. Has he ever done this for anybody else? Not that I'm aware of. 
The doctor has told me this can't be turned around. This can't be reversed. Oh, I feel God. Everybody's telling me they've never seen God do anything like this before. Oh, you're in good, you're in miracle territory there. You're in, I said, you're in miracle territory now. Because whenever you've come to the end of yourself, and man has come to the end of himself, and flesh has run out, and resources have run out, and money has run out, my God, and the supply has run out. You've just got to the beginning of God. Because I said, when you've come to the end of yourself, you've just come to the beginning of God. Paul said it best in Philippians 4 and 19. He said, but my God shall supply, shall supply, shall supply all your me according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I thank God somebody had enough sense in the wedding party to call on Jesus. Somebody had the wherewithal to call on Jesus. The Bible says in verse 2, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the wedding. That word called from the original Greek that Jesus used, that John uses here, Jesus, that word means he was summoned. He was invited. And I love this one. He was called specifically by name. Someone in the family sent a personal invitation with Jesus' name on it, inviting him to the wedding. And because someone there specifically called Jesus by name, David said in Psalms 91, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him And honor him. Jesus said, when you call on me, this trial will not bring shame to you. It will not bring dishonor to you. Jesus isn't going to leave you on red. Jesus isn't going to leave you hanging. No, no, no. But he said, when you call on me, when you call on me, I'll answer you. I'll be with you. I'll deliver you. And I will honor you. Somebody had enough sense to write a letter to Jesus. Jesus, I want to invite you to the wedding. I want you to invite you into my home. I want to invite you into my situation. I want to invite you into my problem. And because Jesus was invited, because Jesus was called on, he said, I'm coming. I'll answer. I'll RSVP. I'll show up. I'll be with you. I'll deliver you. I will honor you. He said, with long life, I will satisfy. That word means to complete you, sustain you, to fill you to abundance and overflowing. And show him my salvation. I'll show you. I will show you what I can do. I feel the Holy Ghost telling me, I want to show you what I can do. I want to prove to you just what I'm capable of when you call my name. Call me by name. Call me by Jesus. Woo, Jesus. Jesus, come on, just tell him, Jesus, I invite you. Jesus, I invite you. In the, come on, Jesus, I invite you. I invite you to be a part of my life. I invite you. Come on, I'm inviting you. I've, done, I've gone as far as I can. I've run out of myself. I've run out of my flesh. I've run out of ideas. I've run out of resources. But Jesus, I invite, oh God, I feel you. Jesus, I invite you into my marriage. Jesus, I invite you into my bedroom. I'm preaching. Jesus, I invite you into my family. My God, Jesus, I invite you to come with me on the job. Jesus, I invite you into my business. Jesus, I invite you into my kids. Jesus, Jesus, you're welcome in this church. Jesus, you're welcome in these ministries. Jesus I will satisfy Jesus 
I am not late, says the Lord. I have simply tarried my coming to reveal how desperately you need me. I've not forsaken you. I've not abandoned you. I've not forgotten you. I've not ignored you, says the Lord. I've heard every time you've called. But this time I heard you call my name in desperation. This night my word has quickened your spirit. And you have called not from your lips but from your heart. You have called me by name. And if you will let me, I will answer you. I will answer you in your time of trouble. I will deliver you from all fear, anxiety, depression, and stress. I will honor you. I will satisfy you with abundance. I will show you my salvation. Come to me, says the Lord. Call on me, for I am an ever-present help in trouble. I said in my word, whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on me. What are you waiting for? You're empty. You're dry. You're barren. You have nothing left to give. My son, you're worn out. You're tired. You're weary and well doing. My daughter, you're so stressed. You've been hurt so badly. You've been stung by others. You have nothing left to give but tears. But when you call my name, just know I'm on the way. I'm moving even now on your behalf. Even as I speak, I'm moving closer. I will fill your barren pots with new wine. There is fresh joy. Oh, God. There is more abundance. There is healing to overflowing. There is Holy Ghost baptism. There is salvation in my blood. Oh, I have everything you need, says the Lord. Call me once again. Believe on me once again. And watch me bring salvation into your situation. Trust me now. Watch me. Ooh. Depend on me. Lean on me. Not what you see. But trust in my name. For the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous can run into and they are safe. There's safety in me. Call my name. Call my name. Speak my name. Ooh. Demons tremble at my name. Hell is shaken at my name. Strongholds are broken at my name. Call my name. I'll reverse the curse, says the Lord. I'll reverse what hell has tried to do in your family. I'll turn everything around, my God. I'll restore. I'll renew you. Call my name. Call on me in ever-present help in trouble. I'm waiting now, says the living Lord of hosts. Lift your hands. Thank God. Thank God, thank God. Come on, just stand to your feet. Come on, just call out the name of Jesus. Come on, come on, just call out the name of Jesus. Jesus. 
Jesus, I invite you to move. Jesus, I invite you to move in my family. Jesus, I invite you. Come on, Jesus, I invite you. I've come to the end of myself. No, you've just come to the beginning of God. I've come to the end of my resources. You've just got to the very beginning of what God can do. I don't want to, I don't want, I'm not going to try to embarrass anybody or call anybody out. And I do firmly believe that there's somebody having a family crisis. I, I, if I've ever heard from God, I heard from him today, a family crisis. Now, I don't want to embarrass you. I don't. So this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. Wherever you are, wherever you are, this is what we're going to do. We're going to make this whole church an altar. What I want you to do, just gather around. Get five or six people right around you. Grab them by the hand. Grab their hands. Just come on. Make a circle right where you are. Make a circle right where you are. It may be you. It may be the person beside you who has a need. Who has a need. Come on. But I want you to pray over them right now. I want you to speak over their life. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus. I don't know what they may be facing, God. I don't know when you're going to move, Lord. I don't know what it's going to look like when you do, Jesus. But God, I know that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we're able to ask or even think. Speak the name of Jesus over that family. Speak the name of Jesus over that household. Come on, speak the name of Jesus over their children. Shout up, oh, Jesus, we call on you. Jesus, we call on you. We summon you, Lord.
I've learned this. Drawing from an empty vessel will lead to nothing but frustration. You keep just drawing and drawing and nothing comes. You'll leave church thirsty. You'll stay dissatisfied, frustrated. Because nothing can satisfy. Nothing can satisfy like this new wine of the Spirit of God. But if we'll just call on Him, if we'll just invite Him in, He can turn. You don't, you don't want to miss Sunday, by the way. We're going to, we're going to finish this Sunday. But he can turn our natural things into supernatural blessings. He'll turn our efforts into glory if we'll just be faithful. Oh, God. He called the whole of us. We'll just be obedient to what he says when he gets here. Y'all can't miss Sunday. You can't miss Sunday. Please don't miss Sunday. He'll turn our natural into supernatural. Our efforts into glory. I'm so glad I serve a God of abundance. Aren't you thankful for that tonight? Thank you so much for coming. Shake hands. Be friendly in the house of God. Senior Adult Ministry meeting at 10 a.m. in the morning. Oasis Senior Adult Ministry. Be here at 10 a.m. in the morning.